but we did it by going back briefly to a point that I made in the previous lecture when I talked about banks and people depositing money in banks and then receiving a ticket money substitutes. There are actually two types of banks which historically were separate institutions and have become one institution. There exists on the one hand what we can call deposit banks and on the other hand we have savings and loan bank banks. And I did already talk about deposit banks briefly. Briefly, what a deposit bank is. You turn your money into a bank, and you don't give up your property in the money that you give to the bank. The bank is a safekeeper of your money and you get a ticket which you can redeem at any time you want into the real thing that you deposited in the bank. Why would you do that and why would the bank do this? The bank accepts your deposits which it redeems at any time you want into the real thing only if you pay a fee, that is, you pay the bank for a service that the bank provides you. What is the service that the bank provides you? It is the bank safe keeps your money and it does something else. It helps as a clearing institution. That is to say, if uh, you have an account at the bank, uh, and you have to pay a bill to somebody else, um, the bank can also pay your bill, pay somebody else with money that you have deposited in the bank. I have 100 ounces of gold in the bank. Uh, I need to pay you whatever 50 ounces because I have bought something. Uh, if the other person from which I bought something is also a client with the same bank. What the bank can then do is simply transfer 50 ounces of gold to your account and take it from my account. And for this service of clearing bills, so to speak, you are also willing to pay a certain fee. Otherwise, it would be more complicated for you to make your payments to other people who live far away, for instance. So there is, it is not difficult to explain why people would want to pay a fee for this service that the deposit bank uh, performs for, for you. They do something for you and you pay for it. Because there is competition between different deposit banks, this fee that you have to pay for them keeping an account for you, paying your bills at your order and so forth, uh, competition between banks results in the fact that this depositing fee will tend to be a minimum fee. Um, people will go to the banks that charge lower fees and avoid banks that charge higher fees or other things people can say. Um, and then we have savings and loan banks. Deposit banks do not pay you interest. You have to pay a fee. No interest. Savings and loan banks, there we have savers who hand over some saved sum of money and hand it over for some period of time to the bank. We give up ownership in what we have saved and the bank becomes temporarily the owner of this money. And what does the bank then do? The bank then loans out this money against 
interest. The bank then loans this money to someone else, and this someone else, after a certain time, is supposed to repay the bank the loan, and the bank is then able to repay you. Important to realize is in savings and loan banking contracts, I give up my property for a while. It, the bank becomes temporarily the owner of the funds. And then whoever receives the loan from the bank becomes temporarily the owner of the funds. And then it flows back to the original owner. But in this case, of course, because you give up ownership of your money that you give to the savings institution, what do you expect to get from the bank is you expect to get an interest. What does a bank then do when it loans out the money to someone else is they charge them interest. And how does a money, how does a bank make its money by the interest differential. That is, they promise me as a saver, let's say, 5% interest. They charge the borrowers an 8% interest. And this difference between 5% that they pay me and 8% that they charge whoever borrows the money, this difference of 3% is the income of the bank, the interest differential. Um, the bank performs a service for you. The service is, it brings the saver together with the investor. <coughs> if you would, as a saver, know all potential investors, then you could, of course, give your money directly to the businessmen <coughs> and the investors, and he would pay you directly the entire 8%, so to speak. Why are you satisfied with 5%? The answer is you typically do not know who all the potential investors are. And for performing this service of bringing together the saver and the investor, the bank deserves, so to speak, this interest differential of 3%, which makes up its income. Again, competition between different savings and loan banks will result in the fact that this interest differential becomes as small as it can be. It can never shrink to zero. There's always to remain something, otherwise the bank would not be able to make any money. Um, but competition reduces this interest, this interest differential. So now we have to look for a moment some simple technical matters relating to interest. And then I will explain how this phenomenon of interest comes into existence. Let's say I have a hundred dollars saved up. Um, and I hand these hundred dollars as a loan um, to you, let's say for one year. I give you $100 now, and you promise me you pay back $100 in a year from now. The question that I want to ask is, is such a deal? I give you $100 now, and you promise to me that you return $100 to me in one year's time, is that something that is possible in commercial relations? Or is that something that is impossible? Now, it is certainly possible in some sense. I, when I was younger, I frequently asked my father, can you just give me some money? Um, gave it to me, and then he said, yeah, yeah, then uh, give, it, give it back to me um, later on. And um, frequently I've 
So he forgot about the whole thing. So he basically gave me hundred dollars and absolutely nothing was returned to him. Um, so in this sense, that is certainly possible. Um, because the motive of benevolence, of love, was involved. Though so let's assume my father does not love me at all. Um, might he then agree to a deal such as this? Hundred present dollars for the promise, hundred dollars will be returned to you in one year's time. But let's assume there's absolutely no uncertainty. Uh, that is perfectly safe that I will live for a year, and you will live for a year, and all the rest of it. So, and the answer is, no, such a deal would not be possible. Instead, anyone who gives away $100 in exchange for a promise, something will be returned to you later on, will insist that what he receives in the future must be more than he is giving away presently. Why is that? Look, if I If, if I simply kept my hundred dollars and wouldn't give it away in the form of a loan, how many dollars do I then have after one year? One hundred minus one hundred. One hundred. I mean, not not minus anything. No, no. I keep I keep my hundred dollars and don't give it to you. And then I keep the four year, then I still have hundred dollars, that's it. Um, if I loan you the hundred dollars and you return one hundred dollars to me after one year's time, yes, I have hundred dollars at the end of one year too, but in which situation would I be better off as the one who has saved the hundred dollars? If I kept the hundred dollars for the entire year and also ended up with hundred dollars, or if I gave you the hundred dollars and you returned the hundred dollars to me after a year, in which situation would I be better off? The answer is, of course, if I simply kept it. Why? What is the additional advantage that I have if I simply kept it and end up with hundred dollars? Then, during the year, I have full control over the hundred dollars. On the other hand, if I gave you the hundred dollars, and tomorrow or in a week, some emergency happened and I needed the hundred dollars, can I then go to you and say, return the hundred dollars to me? And the answer is, of course, no. Because for one year, you are the owner of the hundred dollars. I am only entitled to have these hundred dollars returned to me after one year of time has elapsed. So in order for me to be willing to give you a hundred dollars, I would want to get somewhat more than hundred dollars which I could have anyway if I kept the money myself and have the additional advantage I have full control over it in the course of this addition here, whether it's 105 or whatever, plays no role. This addition we call interest. The five more dollars, or one more dollar, or ten more dollars, whatever it happens to be, but it has to be more than this. We call this, in this case, the interest rate, that is the premium of present goods over future goods. I'll explain that in greater detail later on. Present goods that I have right now are always more valuable than even the most 
safe promise of a future good. Or we can just reformulate it the other way around. Future goods always sell at a discount against present goods. Future goods of the same kind are less valuable than the good right now. The interest rate is the premium of present goods over future goods, or looked at from the other side, the discount of future goods as compared to present, present goods. To get a few more technical details. If we had inflation and we anticipated the inflation, let's say I anticipate there will be next year, in the course of one year, there will be 5% inflation. Would it then be possible that somebody exchanges 100 present goods for 105 future goods with inflation? The answer is no, that is also impossible because these hundred and five dollars would be the exact equivalent of one hundred dollars. So if inflation is expected to occur, what happens to the nominal interest rate? The nominal interest rate will then go to 10 percent, let's say, 210. I would have to promise you $110 will be paid back to you in one year's time. Five, per, five of these additional $10 would be just compensation for inflation that takes place. And 5% would be the real interest return that you earn. But if I kept for myself 100 and I didn't spend it, so after one year it would be 95 and if he will return me 105, so it means that already I got the gain. Like I didn't lost money. In this, in this case, yeah. yes, of course, I I would have to invest these hundred dollars in yes. order to win. But, but so would the other person have to do it. Right? it yeah. Both we both would have to invest. But in one case, I would own the investment. In the other case, somebody else would own the investment. So the same argument applies there. Just the same. Um, what would happen under deflationary conditions? Let's say these hundred dollars in one year time are worth more. I mean, I explained that that is not something that happens very likely nowadays, but it did happen in the past. Um, could it be then that the interest rate could become zero or even negative? So the answer is no, again, it could not happen because I could again keep the hundred dollars, wait for a year, and then the purchasing power of the hundred dollars would also be greater. But if I had loaned it out to you, and you have control, and I do not have control. So, under all conditions, whether inflationary or deflationary, the interest, rate, interest return has to be positive. It has to be above zero. This does not mean that in real life your interest return will always be positive. In anticipation, that is, when you make the deal, the expectation is always the interest return will be positive. But it can, of course, happen that the person goes bankrupt. And you neither get an interest return, nor do you get your principal back. Um, in anticipation, it is always, we expect to receive a positive interest return. If I made a mistake in my estimation of the inflation rate, for instance, I expected the inflation rate to be 5%. 
and instead it is 10%. And I agree, you pay me $110 for 100, and if he repays 110, then of course I did not actually earn any interest return at all. I was just compensated for the ensuing inflation um, in, the, in the meantime. But then I made a mistake, so to speak, anticipating that the inflation rate would be lower than it actually, uh, than it actually was. So under all circumstances, again, the interest rate will be positive. We do not know how, how much above zero it would be, but it, is, it can be understood, so to speak, why it cannot, at least in anticipation, fall to zero or actually become negative. In real life, it can, of course, happen that it is negative or it is zero, but not in anticipation at the moment when we make this type of um, this type of exchange. How do we distinguish the real interest rate from the nominal interest rate? Um, the real interest rate is the nominal interest rate minus the rate of expected inflation. There is in the market, just as for prices in general, a tendency that the real interest rates will be uniform throughout the market. This is the, the reason for it is the same as for uh, the prices of all goods tend to be the same at different locations except for transportation costs. If you have whatever beer being far more expensive at this place in town than at that place in town, um, then people would go to where it's cheaper, prices there would rise, would avoid the places where it's more expensive, prices would fall. There's always a tendency for prices of the same things to become the same at different locations, except for transportation costs. This is also true for interest rates. If, let's say, interest rates in Lithuania would be 5% and interest rates in the United States would be 10%. If you were a saver, where would you depart? Where would you save your money? You would go where the interest rate is higher. If the interest if the supply interest rate is determined by the supply of loanable funds and the demand for loanable funds. The supplier of loanable funds are the savers. The demanders of loanable funds are the investors who want to take the savers' money. The interaction of these two curves determine what the interest what the interest rate is. So the suppliers of loanable funds would go to the United States. If the supply of loanable funds in the United States increases, what happens then to the interest rate in the United States? Would fall. If the supply of something increases, the price of it will fall. On the other hand, the demanders of loanable funds, the investors, where would they go in this case? Well, they would, of course, go here. Mm -hmm. After all, to get a loan is cheaper in Lithuania than it would be in the United States. If the demand for loanable funds increases in Lithuania, what happens then to the price of loans? That is the interest rate that you have to pay for it. Then the price increases. So in the United States, the tendency would be for this rate to fall, and in Lithuania, it would be for this rate to rise, with the tendency, of course, that the interest rate 
in both places would become the same, the real interest rate, not necessarily the nominal interest rate. If, if expected rate of inflation in the United States would be 5%, and the expected rate of inflation in Lithuania would be zero, then the real interest rate in the United States would be 5%, and the real interest rate in Lithuania would also be 5%. In that case, that is, we expect higher inflation in the United States, otherwise inflation in Lithuania. This difference in interest rates, in nominal rates, can remain in existence forever. Because the real interest rate at both places would, of course, be the same. So there's always a tendency throughout the market, interest rates become the same just as the prices for all sorts of other goods tends to become the same at different locations, abstracting for the moment from transportation costs and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Now, in the interest rates that we observe in the market, there are typically various additional components involved. So when I say interest rates tend to become the same throughout the market, what that means is interests of the same risk. There are, of course, there is in every interest rate that we pay in the market a risk component. Riskier loans require higher interest payments than absolutely safe uh, loans. And there is, as I also explained, there is uh, an inflation component in interest rates as we pay them in the market. In order to understand, so to speak, how to separate these elements, the risk component and the inflation component from the pure interest component, we construct some Some, sort of, some model. Imagine for a second something that is that we refer to as equilibrium, or in Ruby for Jesus' economy is called the evenly rotating economy. That is the following idea. We eliminate all uncertainty from the world. Analytic. So we assume that everybody knows exactly the future and people produce the same thing, the same rate over and over again and consume it at the same rate. There's absolutely no change ever taking place. All people perform the same sort of procedures over and over again. No uncertainty. Every process will be repeated and repeated and repeated. In such a world where there's absolutely no uncertainty, businessmen do no longer make any type of profits or losses. Nobody can obviously make losses because they know exactly what to produce, what the prices will be, that will be paid and so forth. And nobody makes any profits either. But what they would make in such a world is still an interest return. 
you realize in this world there is no risk component because there is no risk, everything will be repeated and repeated over and over again. So the risk component disappears. And inflation component also disappears, at least insofar as whatever inflation is, it will be anticipated. Exactly, people know what that is. But why would there be still interest? The answer is, even in such an evenly rotating economy, what happens is, of course, that the capital goods, uh, the machinery, the, house, the houses, office buildings, and so forth, that we use, will be gradually used up. And what is necessary in order to replace all of these worn out capital goods exactly at the moment when they fall into disrepair with new, exactly identical uh, capital goods. Remember, in order to always do the same thing over and over and over again, there is still something necessary. All worn out things must be replaced with exactly the same type of machinery that we used before. So what must still go on, even if we have an unchanging economy? What is necessary so that we can replace the worn out capital goods? That people must save. They must save in order to be able, and I'll explain it in a while with greater detail, they must continue to save in order to replace whatever breaks, disappears from the scenery with exactly identical copies. In order to remain in this evenly rotating economy where everything repeats itself. And what have we just seen? Does a saver expect as a reward for his saving? Remember, a saving means I make a present sacrifice, I give you something, and I want to have something in return, the interest return. So even in this general equilibrium scenario, savings and interest will still be in existence. Otherwise, we will fall out of the equilibrium. So this is the analytical method in order to show that there is a pure interest component which can be analytically distinguished from the risk component and the inflation component as we see it in real interest rates in the real world that are being paid. So we construct some sort of fantasy world in order to show that there are three components. Uh, in the interest rate as it is paid in the market, which always complains and contains a risk component and an inflation component. So now I want to come to an explanation, a more profound explanation of, of why it is that an interest return must be paid. And the key insight, the explanation is, Interest is due to what we call time preference. And the phenomenon of time preference is nothing else but the fact that I already pointed out present goods are always more valuable than future goods. <coughs> present goods trade at a premium against future goods of the same kind and future goods trade against a discount or trade at a discount against present goods of the same kind. <coughs> Why is that the case? Because people cannot wait forever to get satisfied.